just regale me with your life story. <laughs> I'm from uh, Chandler, Arizona. I'll just work it into my uh, political uh, sort of I introduction. I, mm. I was in uh, Chandler, Arizona, uh, born in Mesa. So I've been in like central Arizona and I used to drive up to Sedona with my dad to meet, you know, his, uh, his parents, my grandparents on his side. And Sedona is like a gorgeous place to walk around. But when you're, you know, super young, 10, 11, 12, you don't really appreciate the beauty or don't really care to go on walks and sightsee. So we would just sort of sit in the, around the house and we would talk politics more or less. Um, they were really big, I think John Edward supporters and then Barack Obama supporters. And they convinced me to uh, support Obama. I was very in on uh, hoping uh, in the hope and the change sort of movement. At the time, I saw the state as a mechanism for, I think, the masses of people to really influence society. Whereas there's a predatory profit-seeking private market, the state is a mechanism we could infiltrate and achieve our desires. In the absence of that, we basically would not be able to live any sort of life worth living. After Obama was elected, I heard uh, some arguments, well, uh, my grandparents would always say, Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck are the two e most evil SOBs on the planet. And I go, oh, my God, I got to hear these guys. All they do is just talk crazy. And they probably, you know, hate Obama because he's black, because that's the only reason you could hate a guy who's so nice and just wants to help people. And I came across the argument that uh, Obamacare, while there were pros and cons on the economic side, uh, it would actually force people to purchase something against their will. Now, regardless of what you think about, whether it's uh, a smart, effective, good thing, short-term, long-term, uh, to uh, purchase health insurance for yourself, I was specifically intrigued by, should you be forced to purchase this against your will? And I really wrestled with that, and I ended up uh, moving over to the Romney side, which at the time felt like a really big switch, considering everyone was calling me an idiot and a terrible hating of the poor person to do. And uh, it just took me, gosh, probably took me six years to take that principle. It's wrong to force someone to do something against their will, so long as they're not initiating aggression, coercive, physical interference with another peaceful person. Took me like six years to apply that principle consistently and become an anarcho-capitalist. I was a big Romney supporter, but seeing Ron Paul on the stage was like brilliant. It, it, was, it was so different because you go from talking about the technicalities of a policy and 36%, 39%, and this guy said, abolish the minimum wage and abolish the income tax. And uh, the, the income tax, I, I don't remember what his argument was on the stage at the time. I know why I'm against it now, but specifically the minimum wage. I had been in sort of the political sphere for a number of years, just listening, obviously. I was real young. But I had n I, I never thought that there was any such thing close to an argument against the existence of a minimum wage. Now, when you look at the evidence, it turns out a small fraction of people get the minimum wage, which proves that uh, you don't need a state or else everyone's going to be paying the bare minimum because market... <laughs> Yeah, because market competition actually bids up prices higher than they otherwise would be in the absence of competition, voluntary funding, being able to leave the job and go elsewhere. So you have that aspect, and then you have the reality that it hurts people with the least amount of skills, the least amount of experience. You have smaller businesses which can't afford to comply. So it's no wonder, you know, and then this is all secondary. H. Lee Scott and Doug McMullen, the two last CEOs of Walmart, have come out in support of the minimum wage. Oh, how generous of them. And then Jeff Bezos came out in favor of it. So, of course, when you see something like that, you're not exactly raging against the machine when you and the media and the Democrats and a lot of Republicans and the big CEOs are all on one side and all the professors in academia. So uh, th there was both the 
uh, emotional. I want to fight against the bad guys. Okay, that's taken away. And then there was the logical, well, there's no good argument for initiating violence against a peaceful uh, uh, agreement between people. Internships should be legal. So the reason I harp on the minimum wage thing is that was such a red pill moment for me of there. there's no good arguments against this, you know, uh, not having a minimum wage. And after a few months of researching, I found out there are no good arguments in favor of the minimum wage because all of them say when A and B are making a peaceful uh, interaction, uh, a, a peaceful exchange, C, who is not part of it, has a right to initiate aggression against one or both parties to forcibly stop it from happening. I think Tom Woods is... Um, or maybe he's quoting someone else when he goes, what you don't want to do is look at what poor people are choosing to do and then take away the very thing that they're choosing to engage in at the moment, because that's in effect what it does. Um, so that was just a real wake up moment that, wow, something I really thought was real uh, or, or that was so solid, so foundational, I ended up being wrong about. So that was part of it. Uh, and then the reason I think I left uh, supporting Mitt Romney was uh, hearing the foreign policy disagreements. I always said, Ron Paul has great ideas, but he's weak on foreign policy. He hates America. This one was really gradual because, you know, uh, admiring the American troops for uh, a very organized structure like the military, the brotherhood that the military gives people. This is something that appears to be very solid, very uh, civilization-like, something you, I would even want to be a part of. I tried uh, getting into the military when I was 16, and I was actually, uh, uh, because I was a conservative at the time, I tried to get in, and they had uh, refused me. Um, well, because I was 16, I couldn't get my parents' permission. Um and then what happened? I, I forget where I was first introduced to the ideas because I'd heard Ron Paul talk about blowback, but I'd had no clue that before 9-11, there was actually a uh, U.S. response to Iraq invading Kuwait, which involved killing a mass number of uh, military members in the Iraqi army who were slaves, which today is called conscripts. A lot of them were enslaved with this oh so cool patriot bomb that could like you know murder you know tens of thousands in a second or something. So that was the first time where I'd said, well maybe this isn't something we should really be celebrating. And then I heard about civilian deaths as a cause or result of sanctions imposed by now uh, you know the United Nations, uh, U.S. United Kingdom uh, sort of uh, front that was there. And once you hear about that, it's like, gosh, let's just apply to the government the same standards we'd applied for anyone else. Walmart says I can't shop anywhere until, you know, the local gang lord surrenders. Well, obviously, in that case, you're initiating violence against tons of innocent people because of one dictator who they're already suffering under. So when I just took this logical moral compass and applied it to the state, a compass I pretty much already had that I applied in my everyday life, I became a libertarian. And then uh, the primary documents of, uh, of Osama bin Laden writing against, uh, you know, why he uh, does not like the U.S. in his own words. You know, you, you don't get the actual idea of, well, they hate us for our freedoms and stuff. Well, there's a lot of countries that are as free as America that they don't exactly hate. And you actually see it's because of the Iraqi sanctions. It's support for Israel, who engaged in the Kana massacre in Lebanon and a United Nations hospital. It's the U.S. bombing in uh, Somalia. It's the U.S. what today atrocities going on in the Saudi U.S. Uh, regime change attempt in Yemen. So uh, opening my eyes to a lot of this also made me a libertarian on the uh, both principled and utilitarian ground that it's just so terrible. Meanwhile, the troops are over there and at home while they're fighting for our freedoms. We have lockdowns, which are all unconstitutional. Even judges say it, and Gretchen Whitmer still goes along with it. We have uh, mask mandates, uh, which Jeff Tucker, what's he call it? I think he calls it mass asphyxiation. <laughs> <laughs> Just great. Uh, we have uh, Thanksgiving limits in some states. In the biggest state, uh, Gavin Newsom, we have Andrew Cuomo. These are not like 
little events. These are like the two, two of the three biggest states yeah, in America. Thing, sorry not to cut you off, but that shit is yeah. so wild. <laughs> It, it's so unbelievable that yeah. it's like, you know what? Troops do have to come home from Afghanistan and protect us from these governors. Yeah. But, uh, but then that, that therein lies, therein lies another <clears throat> um, sort of red pill moment where if you participate in an action, regardless of other people telling you to do the immoral action, you have more moral culpability because them saying words and you performing an action it does not strip you of responsibility. So the troops and the policemen, uh, I, I think, are the ones who are just as responsible as the governors. Yeah, that is for, one for, that for people these struggle orders. with. So